Hey, welcome to uh, the Southeast Asia Seminar um, Series. Today we have Dr. Uh, Mike Dwyer uh, from Indiana University, Bloomington. Um, Mike Dwyer is a political ecologist who studies agrarian change, environmental governance, and infrastructure development in Southeast Asia. Uh, he's conducted fieldwork in Laos and Cambodia on the social and legal geographies, as well as the policy uh, trade-offs of large-scale land deals, land um, titling, uh, new road and energy infrastructure, and carbon forestry. He teaches in the geography department at Indiana University um, Bloomington and holds a research affiliation with the University of Bern's, uh, Bern's uh, Center for Development and Environment. I'd like to um, invite now uh, my, Dr. Dyer to, uh, uh, to begin his talk. Um, thank you very much. And welcome. Super. Uh, thanks, Michael, for the invitation um, and, the, and the introduction. Um, let me share my screen here and get my slides back up. Um, all right, does that look okay? Can you see, see slides, everything? Yeah, that looks great. All right, um, let me see. Um, I can get keep the chat going here just in case so I can see things pop up. Um, all right, uh, let's get started. Thanks everybody for coming um, this afternoon, this evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, it's great to see a couple of uh, old familiar faces, um, Jean-Christophe Dupart and Sukpia Young are friends and colleagues from long-term collaborations here. Um, and it's also great to see a handful of folks who I've never met. So I look forward to interacting with you um, as best we can. It's, uh, it's always um, a little bittersweet to, to do talks online because you wanna be in person, but it's also a wonderful chance um, to uh, be able to do this at all since um, I obviously can't travel to London um, mid-semester right now. Sure. Um, so this is um, a chance for me to, uh, this is the second time I've given a chance, I've had a chance to um, present my new book. Um, the title of the book is Upland Geopolitics, Post-War Laos and the Global Land Rush. Um, you can see a shot of, uh, of the cover here um, in the lower right. Um, the book came out last fall, um, so it came out in September from the University of Washington Press. Um, for those of you who are Southeast Asianists in the group, um, you may know some other titles in the series. Uh, it's in a series called Culture, Place, and Nature. Um, so, for example, Pam McElwee's book uh, on Vietnam forests or gold is in that series, as well as John Padway's um, Fragmented Forests, Disturbed, Fragmented Memories, Disturbed Forests, as well as a book um, that I'll talk a little bit more about called Turning Land into Capital. Um, I'll say more about that in, in a couple of minutes. Um, ordinarily, I am not a huge fan of talks that are read, um, and so I'm going to try to give um, as much of a spontaneous talk as I can. Um, but since it is a book talk, I'm going to read a couple of excerpts, um, and I'm a little bit nervous about doing that because it showcases the prose of the book, which is a scary thing as an author. Um, but I really have tried to write the, the book in a way that is, um, uh, that moves narratively and that can be um, accessible and hopefully used in undergraduate and graduate classes. So I wanted to give you at least a flavor of some of the text. Um, so I'm gonna do that um, starting um, actually pretty soon. Um, I'll say more about the project uh, as a whole um, in a couple of minutes, but I wanted to start with the opening sketch of the book um, for and, and to not preface it with too much framing um, for reasons that I think will be obvious once, uh, once, I, once I read it. Um, so let me start there. Um, I got to get my slides to advance. Here we go. Um, so the passage I'm about to read is about this map that you're uh, the, that you can see here. A large hand-painted map greets visitors to the rubber tree nursery just outside Vieng Phuca, a rural district capital in northwestern Laos. Taking up much of the second story wall of the nursery's main building, its title is long and formal. Land use map of the 3,000 hectare rubber planting promotion project, Yingpuka District of Bolisat LTD, Yunnan Province, People's Republic of China. Despite its size and prominent display, however, the map itself is easy to miss. Aside from its thickly painted title, little else is visible. Um, its thin black lines and faded yellow patches blend in with the weathered off-right background. 
the legend lightly sketched out in the, in the map's bottom right corner has yet to be filled in at all. When my Lao colleagues and I first came across this map in 2007, it was barely legible. This was not simply because it was hard to see. Even when the image came into view, it was still impossible to read. Maps make sense because they contain symbols that tie or index them to the real world. This map had no visible indices, at least none that our team, a research delegation from Laos's land, National Land Management Authority, could make out. The cartography itself gave few visual clues about what the various lines or patches might represent, and no obvious symbols for roads, rivers, villages, or prominent landmarks linked its faintly drawn polygons to the landscape, to the landscape around us. Here you can see the, the faintly drawn polygons in a little bit more detail. The legend, the missing le legend didn't help either. It was as if the whole thing had been drawn to announce the project's presence without actually giving away anything about its operations. Our confusion stemmed from the fact, fact that we were seeing this formal geography of rubber plantation promotion for the first time. We were thus limited to the sorts of inquiries reserved for unprepared visitors. What was the project doing? Where was it working and with whom? How far along was it? When would the rubber trees mature? Had we understood the map, we might have asked why the project was targeting agriculturally zoned land for conversion to industrial tree crops, a violation of central government food security policy designed to prevent the replacement of food crops by industrial tree plantations. We might also have asked how the project was, impl was impacting local land holdings, since as we would later learn, the project's greater, greatest conversions of food production land to rubber plantations were in the district's poorest and most socially vulnerable villages. Finally, we might have pushed harder to find out exactly what project planners and local authorities meant by rubber plantation promotion. The word in Lao is song sum, since later we would discover that this term meant different things in different places. These were the questions that mattered. As it was, however, the map confronted us as an inscrutable black box. Unable to open it, we could only ask the polite questions reserved for visitors. So this passage gives you a sense of um, both the ethnographic voice of the book, but also um, the key case around which the book is constructed, um, as well as two of the key themes that permeate the book itself. Um, the case is um, Chinese bilateral cooperation in Northwestern Laos um, that took place largely over the last two decades. Um, in the book, I focus specifically on the year 2000, um, when China's going out policy began, um, and I ended in 2018, which is uh, when I last uh, was able to do field work before having to submit the final manuscript. Um, and then two, two themes that come through briefly, but which I'll talk more about in the talk, um, are first the unevenness of the enclosure process, but also the, um, the invisibility of enclosure itself, or what I in the book I develop as the theme of bureaucratic ele illegibility, or just the difficulties of figuring out where enclosures are taking place. Um, in the book, I frame this um, in terms of an intervention into uh, really two big questions around the phenomenon of transnational land deals that um, really began in the early to mid 2000s and that were recognized later in the decade, starting in around 2008, um, as a new global land rush, or in some framings, a new global land grab. Um, and the two questions um, I frame here in terms of uh, a reaction to a quote from uh, agrarian studies scholar Mark Edelman, who in 2013 um, talked about the global land rush as an accelerated process of dispossession that was clearly in motion. Um, but one of the things that you see as you start to study it in the field is that it's highly uneven. Um, and in terms of two of the words that I've already mentioned to that are, you sometimes hear the word land rush and, and land grab. Um, I play these terms off of each other in terms of uh, one of the defining questions of the book, which is what turns a, a land rush in a general sense into a land grab or a particular, uh, or a series of land grabs in particular places and times. Um, and then secondly, uh, the second question really comes out of some of the findings of the first, which hinge on the state's involvement in creating space for enclosures. Um, but the second question is, has to do with um, 
the difficulties of governments themselves in terms of keeping track of their own land deals. Um, and that's why don't states themselves seem to know often where their own land grabs are. Um, and this is one of uh, the, the questions that really emerged to me, uh, to me from some of the ethnographic field work that I was doing, not only out in the field, but with government officials um, in Laos. So in the book, I really, I take these questions in sequence. Um, and in this talk, in order to keep things manageable, um, Michael asked me to talk for roughly an hour and I'm gonna try to get in a little bit under an hour, but I'm really gonna focus um, mostly on this first question of what turns a land rush into a land grab um, in some cases, but not in others. Um, I'll gesture a little bit to this second question about bureaucratic illegibility, um, and I'm happy to talk about it more in the Q&A, um, but that's not gonna be a major focus um, of the talk. Um, in the, the, the project, um, so let me just uh, do an outline. Um, I'm gonna say a little bit about the project uh, as a whole before I get into really two pieces that underlie the question, uh, the answer to this, this first question. Um, the first is um, to look at contemporary land deals um, along an area that I'll call the Northern Economic Corridor in Northwestern Laos. Um, but the second requires backing up in time and to look at uh, what I'll describe as denationalization of the Lao uplands that um, were, uh, that really stemmed from American Cold War intervention um, in Laos in the 60s and 70s. And so if, if the first part of the story that I'm gonna to tell today is essentially a Laos-China story, the second part is actually a US, um, a, a Laos-US story. Um, and it's the intersection of those things um, through uh, the transition from the Cold War period to really the post-Cold War period in the 90s and early 2000s that created the space um, for a lot of the land deals that I, that I was studying. Um, so first, before we get into the, the details of the story, let me just start with a bit about the project. Um, the, the project itself is gonna look at um, these large Chinese rubber plantations in Northwestern Laos that came out of this era of development cooperation. Um, but when I first went to Laos, I actually was trying to study World Bank development assistance in the hydropower sector. And it was only um, through a series of events and delays and negotiations that I got pulled up to the north um, and traded Western development for Chinese companies um, as the, the focus of, of, my, of my interest. Partly this was the result of um, a series of conversations that were happening within um, both the development, the international development community in Laos, um, as well as among Lao regulators um, in the capital um, who I was getting to know through the course of preliminary and then my, my actual field work, um, who were increasingly concerned about land deals that were taking place all over the country um, and increasingly didn't really have good data about to, to sort of cross check with the stories that they were hearing about. Um, and so one of the things that pulled me to the North was that in contrast to a lot of the large land concessions that were being given directly to companies in the central and southern parts of the country, um, there was allegedly a more cooperative mode of international plantation development cooperation that was taking place among uh, with Chinese companies and Lao communities up in the north. Um, and I'll say more a little bit about this um, in the second part of the talk, but this um, alternative to the large land grab was initially what pulled me to the north. Um, as gestured to from the opening sketch, things got a little bit more complicated. And so um, what I was at, ended up looking at um, were actually quasi concessionary uh, projects, um, but they were traveling under a different heading. So I'll get to that um, in a little bit. Um, as I mentioned in the, in the opening sketch, I was collaborating with the, uh, an institution called the National Land Management Authority. And my work with them um, was ultimately uh, the thing that um, led me to be able to have uh, the sorts of maps like you're seeing here. Um, but already you should see a contrast between 
the sort of fumbling around in the field uh, that I described in the opening sketch and the precision of the data that you can see here on this map. Um, this map was not available to us when we were doing our field work, um, and it wasn't really produced until around 2012, 13, 14. This actually relies on um, data from a bunch of different sources, but the whole process of producing this data um, is, is actually part of the story that the, that the book tries to get into. Um, the, so the, the wider context for this thing called the global land rush or the, uh, or, or the global land grab um, is partly represented here in a map from 2008 that was published in The Guardian, um, right as this thing called the global land grab was starting to take off. And what you can see here is lots of big numbers, um, but very low levels of precision. Um, and it turned out that a lot of the data that came out of this, these early reports um, was actually pretty bad, um, but it was still pointing to things that were happening. Um, but what has happened is that over the years, um, even as we've seen more precise maps emerge in particular places like Laos and here, um, there have been efforts to track land deals more broadly. Um, and in many cases, the same problems of poor data, illegibility, um, what's sometimes glossed as uh, wheat governance um, has really stuck around. And you see this, this is from uh, just fr from last year for a project um, that called the Land Matrix that's tried to keep track of these land deals um, all over the place. Um, my work um, here, you can see the book on the left, um, but I wanted to give um, a plug for another book project that I've been part of as well. Um, and one of my co-authors, um, from this book is, is even in the talk here. Uh, I mentioned Jean-Christophe Dupart. Um, and both of these books um, try to get underneath the numbers and really um, look at transnational land deals and transnational land access using a more regional and, and historical lens. Um, and that's not to say that the numbers don't matter, but that even when the numbers are bad or confusing, there's, there, there's a story there um, that we don't necessarily need good, good numbers to try to tell. Um, and so if the story that I'm going to focus on today is mostly about Laos, and it's mostly really about Northwestern Laos, um, there's also been some efforts to tell the story, to tell a different version of this story at a regional scale. Um, and so I wanted to at least plug this, this book, um, Turning Land into Capital, that's uh, a, essentially a parallel project about development and dispossession in the Mekong region. Um, Getting closer to, to, to the, the, the field work and the story itself, um, as I said, I got pulled north from, initial, from an initial interest um, in hydropower um, and ended up looking at this thing that you can see on this map called the Northern Economic Corridor, which is a road that was um, actually followed an old caravan route between Southern China and Northern Thailand that dates back hundreds of years, um, but that was really imagined as part of the um, northern, uh, sorry, as, as part of the um, what the Asian Development Bank called the Greater Mekong Subregion um, during some regional connectivity efforts that started in the 90s and have really taken off over the last um, decade and a half. Um, this led to the paving of this road that really took place during the piece of during during the the, the extent of my field work. So when I started field work in 2005, it basically looked like this. This is a road that, as you can see from the map, um, connects uh, the, the borderlands of southern Yunnan to um, right near Chiang Rai in northern Thailand. Um, and over the course of its paving and straightening and development, um, turned that trip from, depending on when you were going, either an all-day drive or possibly an impassable drive entirely during parts of the rainy season, um, into a pretty reliable um, three or four hour trip um, between down a paved bitumen uh, straightened road. And this, this is what it looks like now. Um, I got to, to study um, a lot of the, um, you could say the, the discussions with roadside communities that were going through the consultation uh, process um, for the road development. And one of the big things that really jumped out at me from studying the road development process itself um, was that um, as, uh, sorry, I, I have a map um, that I'll show, I'll show you in a little bit. Um, 
But there wasn't a whole lot of mitigation that was done proactively um, in terms of protecting the landscape that surrounded this road. And so in many ways, the paving of this road opened up a whole regional geography um, for a land rush that then took place um, in the general road corridor itself. Um, and so that brings me to the second part of the talk, um, which is the first part of this answer to why do land grabs happen where they do and how they do. Um, and this uh, follows the theme of, of, uh, of the phrase, but in this case, the literal phrase, where the rubber meets the road. Um, and here, I want to go back to the district um, I mentioned in the in the, the opening sketch that I read, the district of Vienkulka. You can see exactly where this is. Um, in, if you look at the inset map um, on the upper right here, and this is a district that is in the, the border province uh, of Luang Nam Ta, which Laos shares um, right on the border of China and Myanmar. Um, but Vieng Phu Ka is an interior district. It doesn't actually touch China. And so it's an area that was made newly accessible when this uh, Northern Economic Corridor was paved. Um, and so unlike some of the borderland communities up in the Northern part of the province, um, communities in Vieng Phu Ka hadn't really been experimenting with rubber. Um, and so when this road was paved, there was a huge amount of interest in roadside lands um, for new rubber development, um, some of which uh, were done by Chinese companies in ways that I'll describe a little bit more. Um, and so this brings me to the second excerpt that I wanna read from the text. Um, this is a little bit longer uh, than the first one, and um, it touches on a place that uh, I'll, um, that I'm going to call Ket Nam Fa. And this is what Ket Nam Fa looks like in 2008. Um, the, the excerpt that I'm going to read takes place um, 10 years later when I, when I went back to visit to, um, to, to do some follow-up field work. Sitting on the table in front of us, the piece of tuber is roughly the size of an adult's fist. It is early July of, 20, of 2018, and I am back in Vieng Phu Ka, following up on the rubber planted here during the boom years of the mid 2000s. My informant is a Lao man of about 50, a village official who is telling me about his days as a labor broker for Bolisat LTD, the Chinese company whose plantations are at the center of the rubber boom here. We are sitting outside at a small wooden table under a sunshade next to the village's single dirt road. I've been here before, a few times, mostly in the months after my colleagues and my run-in with the company map recounted above. For all the changes that the last decade has brought to Northern Laos, the village looks remarkably similar. The houses are still mostly old and wooden. The road is still unpaved, although the rain from the early morning, the rain from early this morning is thankfully keeping the dust down. The upland and upland rice fields green with the, this year's new growth still line the surrounding hills. My informant is telling me about the past and about the transition to the present. A few minutes earlier, he had called over a child from the village and had had him go get something from a nearby house. This something, it turns out, is a piece of wild cassava or manpa that he uses to punctuate his story. During the mid 2000s, my informant had been in charge of recruiting, training, and managing residents of this and the surrounding villages to work for Bolisat LTD, first clearing and terracing the land, as you can see in the photo here, from 2008, then planting and weeding the company's young rubber plantations. But as the seedlings matured and planting and weeding gave way to rubber tapping, and here his account turn, takes the turn that it must in order to accommodate the current situation, the jobs had gone largely to imported workers from a neighboring district. Their dormitory, he gestures to a nearby ridge, is just over there down a feeder road that bisects one of the company's large plantations. Our village is Musur, he says, referencing one of the ethnic groups who live in the mountainous borderlands of Northwestern Laos. The term is from the Burmese word for hunter. Formerly based in the mountains, in the forest, moving from place to place, end quote. He refers to the community inclusively, our village, but from his description and his roles as a labor broker and village official, it is clear that he is himself an outsider, appointed by the district government to help bring development to a village that is seen as among the poorest of the poor. The people here are very poor. They do shift in cultivation, he explains, rehearsing the link between poverty and upland rice farming that one often hears across Southeast Asia and beyond. As he returns to the community's relationship with Bolisat LTD, his account becomes pointed again, 
But this year, he says, the rats came a lot to the upland fields. There are limited lands in the village because the company has a lot of the land, which limits agricultural production. For households without lowland rice paddies, and in this hilly landscape, this means the majority, they have to eat wild cassava because of the rats. We are sitting in, a middle, in the middle of an area local authorities call Ketnam Fa, a small upland valley in Vien Kuka district located in northwestern Laos's Long Nam Ta province. I'll go back to the locator map here. In Lao language, Ket means area or zone, and the Nam Fa is the local river, a tributary of the Mekong, that as you can see here um, on the map in the inset, um, joins the larger Mekong River about halfway where it flows out of China and its passage through the tri-border Golden Triangle, so-called, where Laos meets Thailand and Myanmar. Here and across northern Laos more broadly, the rubber boom of the 2000s was supposed to embody the win-win development cooperation conjured in the um, Laos's so-called three plus two development policy, a loose reference to contract farming formed around 2005 that I'll say more about in a minute. Under this policy, Chinese companies would provide the financing, markets, and technical training, the three in three plus two, to Lao farmers who would use their own land and labor, the two, to grow rubber. A decade ago, as I finished the bulk of the research for this book, this promise of cooperative development was already fraying as Chinese companies large, as Chinese companies large plantations like this one had already by far outpaced smallholder contract farming. In the intervening years, the land grab whose early stages I witnessed in 2006, seven and eight had been cemented into place. Olisat's LTD's plantations had matured and expanded, rubber tapping had, and processing had begun and as already mentioned, the already limited wage work had gone increasingly to outsiders. The tuber on the table, the manpa, subbed up, summed up this transition poignantly. So this is what it looked like when I, when I went back in 2008. You can see the rubber canopy has closed. Um, there's still the, uh, the, the remnants of shifting cultivation fields here on the horizon. Um, many of these have been pushed into a national protected area. So in addition to making uh, local communities work, walk farther, farther in order to get to their subsistence farming land, um, they were also increasingly being criminalized um, by being displaced into a protected area. Um, I wanna focus here for a second on this policy that I mentioned on what uh, was called three plus two cooperation. Um, and I wanna read a quote here that I spend um, a bit of time unpacking in the book. It comes from a, a provincial agreement between um, the province of Luang Nam Ta as well as um, three of the other uh, provinces here uh, in the Northwestern part of Laos, Udom Sai and Bokeo, which together sort of made a block of the provinces at the gateway to China. Um, and the, the policy outlined a vision for plantation development that was actually supposed to be the opposite of large scale uh, plantation concessions to, to companies. And it went like this, the cooperative investment mode is hereby agreed to be the three plus two policy. Namely, investors are responsible for three aspects, capital, technique, uh, and marketing. Um, villagers are responsible for two aspects, labor and land in accordance with state land management. So as I mentioned, um, this is, uh, a, a, this is, this is a, mo a model that sort of evokes contract farming where companies provide inputs and communities actually do the growing and then they produce the, um, the commodity under an outgrower scheme. Um, as it happened though, there was actually a fair bit of debate about um, first how to operationalize this policy and the more I learned, the more um, it became clear that this policy itself was in effect an effort to try to settle a debate between provincial officials who wanted a more smallholder friendly business model to this cooperative investment, um, uh, to, sorry, to, to transnational rubber development cooperation um, compared to companies who really wanted land concessions um, and wanted to be able to control the, the land themselves. Um, what you can see here is, um, this is from a proposal um, that was part of a back and forth series of negotiations between Lao provincial officials and Chinese companies that took place in 2004, uh, five and six. Um, and what, uh, what this was really about was the extent to which plans for large scale cooperation 
um, we're going to be divided between these two business models of contract farming on the one hand versus um, concessions directly to companies on the other hand. Um, there was an agreement that had been made essentially at the bilateral level. Um, so at the top level of, of the Lao government um, in cooperation with Chinese authorities to develop roughly 10,000 hectares of rubber plantations cooperatively in each of the three provinces. But as things then trickled down to the provincial and district levels, there was real pushback um, by local officials um, in terms of how these 10,000 hectares were going to be um, allocated to these different business models. What you can see here is that Lao, um, min Lao, Lao ministry officials said that there was plenty of land, plenty of labor, um, and it, sh it should not be a problem to develop these 30,000 hectares of rubber in the Northwest. Um, but as you got closer and closer to the ground, um, and in particular, the details um, for these two different modes of development were a real sticking point through much of the early 2000s. Um, and one of the ways that this came through to me was in rival proposals from the Lao Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry and a company um, that was incorporated um, in Laos as the Sino Lao Rubber Company, um, which I'm not gonna go through the details here um, in terms of the numbers, but what you can see is that there are very different sets of valuation in terms of what Lao officials compared to Chinese companies thought it would cost in order to develop a plantation of, uh, of a, hect a, a one hectare rubber plantation. And of course, the valuation of inputs to a plantation, to a hectare of plantation, say a lot in terms of the ownership of that ultimate, uh, of the ultimate plantation. Um, because if you look at the Lao Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry's calculations, they actually see a lot of the value of that development in the labor of Lao smallholders. Um, whereas if you look at some of the, the numbers um, in terms of the, on the right side, um, the, the value from smallholder labor um, on the company side, as you can see here captured in uh, the statistics at the bottom here, the summary at the bottom is 36% in the company proposal, whereas it's almost two thirds in, um, of, of the value in, the, in the ministry's proposal. And what this gestured to was an effort to really essentially kick the can down the road and to kick it down to the village level um, in terms of companies negotiating with village authorities and with district authorities in terms of where these projects were actually gonna go. Um, a final dimension of this whole setup for the uneven land grabbing that resulted um, I gestured to this before, but I wanted to come back to this map. This is a map from the Asian Development Bank's mitigation scheme for the building uh, of, or the paving of this road. And what you can see is that most of the mitigation work when it comes to land compensation and land planning happened directly in the road corridor um, within about 50 meters of the center line. So immensely close to the center line. Um, what didn't happen in uh, is everything that's sort of within an economically viable distance of the road, but outside this immediate center line. And so all of these villages that were opened up by the paving of, uh, of the road corridor were essentially um, ripe for a land rush um, that were essentially forced to rely on existing land um, and property relations in those villages, which often varied significantly. And this is what brings me to the second part of the answer to this question, um, which takes place via the, you could say the intersection of um, the, the property rights that existed in, two, in the early 2000s and the longer trajectories of resettlement um, that stemmed from um, the whole recovery and uh, resettlement period after the Cold War. So to come back here, let me start um, with um, the map that I, that I showed you here before. This is where the plantations actually ended up. But in order to get to this point, we need to think about Northwestern Laos in a very different way. So I want you to forget for a couple of seconds, not only about the plantations, but even about the roads 
um, and the development corridors and all the stuff um, that make this landscape the sort of the contemporary connected um, development landscape that it is today. And now I want to take you back to 1972. This is a representation of the northern part of Laos, um, and I want you to focus here on specifically the area that's represented here is Military Region 1 in northern Laos. Um, and as you can see here, there are no roads to speak of whatsoever that show up in this area. Um, this is a period um, when Laos was engulfed in the, by, by this point, the end stages of the, the wider, what uh, is often in the US called the Second Indochina War, sometimes called the Vietnam War. Um, in Laos, this is often called the Secret War. By 1972, it was not, it was much less than secret. secret. It, was, it, was, it was pretty well known. Um, but this map comes from a report that was commissioned by the Rand Corporation um, in the mid 60s, actually no, in the early 70s in order to make sense of uh, the Laos's, uh, sorry, of the US's secret war in Laos. Um, and the key thing here is that even though there was a lot of action around um, this area, the Plain of Jars and Northeastern Laos um, in ways that you may be familiar with if, you, if you've studied the secret war, there was actually a fair bit going on up in the Northwest as well. Um, and all of this stuff turned on, on the, the geography of roadlessness uh, or remoteness. Um, this is the period, um, and you can see uh, in the background here, this map um, from when President Kennedy was spoke about the Laotian crisis in 1962. Similarly, there's there's no there's no infrastructure um, uh, that's reaching up into the northwest part of Laos, um, and this really exemplified um, in the extreme the way that American policymakers understood Laos as a country. Um, and part of what um, the book goes into is the ways in which um, this imagining led to a series of military interventions um, in northern Laos during the 60s and 70s. Um, which in many ways were, were predicated on isolation and what I call the denationalization of, uh, of upland territory in Laos. Um, and this had to do with imagining Laos as something other than a real country. Um, so I want to read just an excerpt here from Blaufarb, um, from Doug, this is Douglas Blaufarb's uh, report that uh, contained the map above called Unconventional War in Laos. History and terrain have divided the land into separate regions with little to bind these together. The population is a mixture of races and religions, of primitive hill tribes and lowland paddy growing Lao peasants who regard each other with fear and hostility. Although in control of the government and its military forces, the ethnic Lao comprise less than half the population. The elite of this Lao minority is a collection of rival clans who share little in the sense of national purpose, but regard the government and the public service as an, an arena where they compete for influence and power to enri enrich themselves. The country as a whole is underdeveloped in every way. A limited road network connects the main towns along the Mekong River, but with few exceptions avoids the hinterland, a rugged roadless expanse of jungled hills and limestone ridges. So that description, um, was really written to describe Laos as a whole and in many ways underlay the US's um, shift from engaging in the urban political milieu of Laos um, and in electoral politics um, from the mid 1950s until around the time of, of the so-called Laotian crisis in 1962, um, at which point the US really shifted gears, um, got out of the urban milieu of politics and really started working with upland uh, minority groups in, very, in strategically located parts of the country. Um, for those of you who, who know something about the history of, of this period in Laos, um, the Hmong were what one historian called the, the, the right tribe in the right place at the right time um, because they lived around this area known as the Plain of Jars in northeastern Laos. Um, but up in, the, up in the northwest, the U.S. was doing something similar not to fight um, the battles uh, with the North Vietnamese army, but to keep an eye on the roads in China, because as part of the US's escalation uh, strategy in Vietnam, um, we were trying to push gently in term toward escalation, but to do so without bringing China into the war. Um, this is taking place in an era before satellite uh, 
observation. Um, and so much of what was going on in the Northwest stemmed from a CIA base that was established in 1962 um, at a place right in the heart of um, the borderlands between what is now uh, Luang Nam Tha and Bokeo provinces that was called Nam Nu. And the base at Nam Nu was essentially built to spy on um, uh, Southern China and to, and to, to watch the roads um, to make sure that the Chinese uh, army wasn't mobilizing mi militarily to either invade um, northern Laos or um, to, to come down into Thailand, which would have been um, from, from the US and its allies perspective even worse. So in order to get us back to the land deals um, that uh, took place roughly 30 years later, I wanna zoom us in on this area that, uh, that you can see here uh, in, in, the, in the red rectangle. And here, I wanna bring in a map from Al McCoy's book, uh, The Politics of Heroin, um, where he really um, helped, helped my research a lot in terms of outlining the geography of uh, what Blaufarb called the tribal program in Laos, um, which he also described as a rather complex organization designed to avoid outright conflict with the Geneva Accords of 1962, which um, under international law made Laos a neutral country. Um, so part of what took place in the aftermath of the Geneva Accords um, took place through the U.S. Agency for International Development, um, through private airlines that were, uh, no, uh, one of which was called Air America, um, and which worked essentially outside of the legal definitions of military intervention, but in ways that were very much military intervention. Um, and I'm going to zoom in uh, in a minute further on this square, um, on this additional red square. But what you can see here is, before I zoom in, um, a series of trajectories that connected northwestern Laos into the borderlands of southern Yunnan and, uh, and eastern Burma um, to carry out these road watch operations um, that allowed the U.S. Um, to, to keep track of what was going on in Southern China. Um, but if any of these teams had been discovered to, to have plausible deniability um, because they were using um, people from ethnic groups that were, um, that lived on multiple, on, on all three sides of the tri-border area. Um, so these were ethnic groups that were found in Laos as well as in Burma Shan state, as well as in Southern Yunnan. And if you zoom in more closely here, you start to get back to the landscape scale at which these rubber projects were taking place. Um, and I wanna talk you through this map uh, first, and then I'll show us uh, another map that was from the book in a minute. Um, the base map here uh, that you're seeing is from a US military map that was made in the 1970s that shows in red the secret uh, landing sites that um, underlay this um, infrastructure of moving road watch teams around Northern Laos and sending them into China and into Burma. Um, LS stands here for landing sites. Um, in particular, I wanna alert your attention to um, uh, landing sites uh, 118 and 118A um, in the lower left here in what is now uh, Bokeo province uh, of, of northwestern Laos. Um, and this is the 118A is uh, the, the CIA base that I mentioned um, at a place called Nam Nu. But scattered throughout this landscape with these other landing sites are other names of villages that have since disappeared from the landscape. Um, in the lower center, you can see Ban Mao Nua. Um, northwest of that a little bit, you can see Kaz Kuiz. You can see Ban Muasua, um, you can see Ban Yao, and lastly, you can see Ban Ka. These are all American renderings of upland uh, village names that evokes uh, different, different uh, upland ethnicities of people who were subsequently resettled uh, uh, involuntarily out of this region and either fled as refugees um, into Thailand and many, many of whom subsequently ended up as refugees in the US or for people who stayed, um, they were resettled to the east um, and ended up in this area right around LS 152, um, which is the district center of Vieng Phu Ka, 
which is now um, uh, a, a, a district center where, where the road passes through. And I'll show you that map in a second. Last thing to point out about this map is that you can see shaded here um, in the polygon that is the same rough shape of the rubber project that I started out with um, back earlier in the talk. Um, and now as I switch the slides, you can see this a little bit in a little bit more detail. This is a map from the book that shows um, both the resettlement that I just gestured to, which is, you can see this resettlement that says to Ketnam Fa. This is people who were, who were settled, resettled forcibly um, from what became the, the frontier between Luang Nam Ta and Bokeo province. Um, these resettlements took place in a series uh, of years, some in the 1980s, some in the 1990s, some even in the early 2000s. Um, they were repeated resettlements. Um, sometimes they were responses to local forms of anti-government activity. Um, sometimes the, res the resettlements were failures um, and led people to leave and move back to some of their old villages. Um, and so this was an essentially a repeated process that led um, government officials from Vien Kuka to try to move people in to this area that um, was subsequently known as Ketnam Fa. So to put it briefly, Ketnam Fa ended up as a resettlement zone for people and uh, descendants of communities who had been involved in being on the wrong side of the war. The second set of arrows that you can see here um, are labeled with uh, this, the terms, tu ba, uh, the, the words Tu Bandang and Tu Ban Udom. Um, and these are two villages that I talk about um, a fair bit in the book. These are very different sets of resettlement. Um, and these are resettlements that were voluntary and that were offered to members of communities that were seen as being on the right side during the war. So um, being on the side of the Patet Lao um, and the ultimately victorious uh, side of the, of the, the Lao uh, People's Democratic Republic. And these were communities that were essentially offered land that had been made available by the forest resettlement of people out of the Western frontier uh, between these two provinces. Um, and so you get these two sets of, of um, resettlement, one coerced, one voluntary that are happening roughly in parallel. Um, and there's back and forth, there's sequences that I get to um, in more detail in the book, um, but that led to, um, people resettling into these villages of Bandang and Ban Udom, um, the, uh, and the former of which is one of the ones that ended up in the rubber project. And as I mentioned earlier, there was this debate that was sort of taking place at the provincial scale uh, about whether Chinese rubber companies should be offered concessions or contract farming schemes um, that would be more pro smallholder. And the way that that debate got resolved was essentially at the village scale. So many of the villages that were enrolled into this project um, were villages that were exemplified by Bandang here. Um, and these were the villages that essentially got the pro smallholder contract farming schemes. Um, and in contrast, uh, the, the people who ended up in Bandang got uh, much more enclosure heavy concession like uh, that are uh, schemes that were framed um, under, under this contract farming language, but that were essentially coerced concessions. So this brings me to the last excerpt that I wanna read from the book here. Um, and this is from much later in the book um, where I'm uh, talking about this geography in more detail. And this, this is Kenam Fa. Um, Kenam Fa's land base was, made, was not made available to Bolisat uh, LTB, the Bolisat LTD, despite the president, the presence, sorry, of local residents, but because of them, their relatively recent resettlement from the district's western frontier meant that Ketnam Fa's residents were treated as de facto wards of the state to whom government officials and technical staff had a special obligation, however self-interested and paternalistic, when it came to li livelihood development. Paternalism features widely in many, in many development contexts, both in and out of Laos. In Ketnam Fa, this took an especially exaggerated form. If residents' displacement from the frontier had been in the interests of wider security concerns, keeping them in Ketnam Fa was seen to be part of the same suite of objectives. The managed enclosures created there were thus aimed, at least initially, not just at making land available to Bolisat LTD, 
but it bringing much needed capital to an ongoing sedentarization and livelihood reconstruction effort. In my interviews with local officials, it quickly became clear that this effort was a fraught one. Taking land from communities that were already seen to be among the, if not the, poorest of the poor was both an outcome and an impression that local officials were keen to avoid. In our conversations, district agriculture and forestry officials thus echoed the three plus two policy rhetoric in noting their general preference for contract farming over concessions, and they took great care to explain that the four plus one plantations in Ketnam Fa uh, were something other than concessions. In multiple accounts, their emphasis was not on land being taken, but on the financial and technical resources that rubber investment was bringing to a landscape where villagers' attachment to the land was already tenuous at best. One district official thus insisted to me that rubber plant, this is the quote, rubber plantation is helping Kui people, this is one of the ethnic groups that was resettled, um, because it's giving them 30% of the new plantation by developing land that they won't use anyway. They go to the forest, cut a new Sweden, make a new house, plant and harvest the rice, and then move on and do it all again in, the next, uh, in a different place the next year. Another official explained the situation similarly, linking the land allocation to Bolisat LTD to the specific challenges confronting the effort to establish permanent livelihoods in Ketnam Fa. Quote, the reason for four plus one here, as opposed to three plus two elsewhere, um, the four plus one is, is the more concession-like variant wherein um, the land was taken from, uh, the, from villages and the, the management of the production was organized by the companies themselves in concession-like fashion. Um, the reason for four plus one here, as opposed to three plus two contract farming elsewhere, is because these villages are, are minority ethnic groups without permanent settlement. They shift from place to place, depending on their Swinton farming. So according to central government policy and district policy to help this group have consistent villages and permanent houses, state officials asked the company to invest in these villages, specifically to plant rubber because rubber is a permanent, uh, is, an, is, a, is permanent farming. Uh, it was hard to land, uh, that's the end of the quote. It was hard to have a land grab, the rationale seemed to be if the social link between the village and the land was missing in the first place. This was certainly spin, but it was not merely that. Just as re the resettlement of this uh, ethnic, ethnic group um, was, the, was, was referred to by the district officials as the Kui, but um, uh, by themselves as the Lahu. So just as Lahu resettlement had, be had been tenuous and ambiguous on the Western frontier, so it remained in Ketnam Fa. Ken Umfa exemplified this extreme structural poverty that has become um, associated with, the, uh, with, with what is called focal site development in Laos. Um, it was the product of resettlement that, uh, as one development worker explained to me in 2007, had occurred without the full consent of those involved and had resulted in high levels of post-resettlement mortality up, with up to 20% of villagers dying in the first couple of years after the move and old people and children suffering the most of all. Resettlement here, the same informant continued, was a multi-temporal process per, pursued, pursued now, he was to, speaking about 2007, with an avowed development rationale, but in the past seemingly associated more with issues of national, in, national security, end quote. This was echoed in other accounts as well, such as the one described in Ketnam Fa's origins in the 1996 government efforts to resettle groups of Lahu who had returned to the Western frontier after an, after an initial early, earlier resettlement after the war didn't last. Another of my informants, a rural development consultant with long-term experience in the area, captured this dynamic in describing one of Ketnam Fa's settlements as a failing village. People don't stay here, he told me, trying to explain the extreme poverty in a part of the country that was already very poor. They sell rice, they sell the rice land they receive from development projects, and they don't know how to raise livestock. Um, they, they don't know how to raise the livestock that projects give them. The army periodically goes out to the forest, rounds them up, brings them back, and leaves, after which they trickle out again. Benham's, uh, sorry, Bolisat. LTD's efforts thus fit, at least initially, within a popular management scheme, within a population management scheme aimed at keeping Ketnam Fa's residents anchored in place through a mix of wage work, the provision of rubber seedlings, and a long-term plan to allocate them 30% of the company's plantation lands under this model that I've called four plus one. 
This mix of land partition and wage work exemplified the concession-like nature of the scheme, contrasting with the three plus two model in ways that exemplified my provincial informant's concern um, that uh, these projects were not actually contract farming projects despite um, being labeled as such. Um, but the four plus one schemes also differed from the concession model occupying an intermediate position on the enclosure spectrum between contract farming and concessions because of the planned partition of, of uh, plantation land. This partial enclosure was a key piece of why tree or land division was attractive to Lao authorities throughout the Northwest. It enticed companies to invest and provide wage work in the short term, like the concessions, but it also offered the promise of a transition to smallholder contract farming once the partition took place. When I returned in 2018, however, although much had changed, this initial plan to keep, village, to keep villagers in place had not been forgotten. Even as the promise of rubber-based livelihoods had all but evaporated, one village head I spoke to recalled that Bolisat LTD had been part of the district opium eradication plan with seedlings provided only to families who had agreed to stay in the village. He summarized the argument that villagers had heard at the time from district officials and company representatives. If you come out of the forest and stop growing opium, you will have better livelihood options. So that, um, as should be clear from the ex excerpts that I have read, was part of a promise that was made back in 2008 um, to try to do rubber in this collaborative way, but that as 2008 gave way to the years that immediately followed, um, really gave way to essentially a concession model where despite the promise of dividing these plantations and giving communities 30% of the land, um, that never happened. Um, it hap the, this non-happening took place differently in different villages, um, but when I returned, uh, as, I as I recounted in 2018, um, the plantations were essentially being cared for by wage workers who had been brought in from other places. Um, and such was the long-term trajectory of enclosure um, that it was clear to me that this, um, it was really these earlier um, and very differently um, driven sets of migration and resettlement processes that were uh, to a substantial degree driving the property relations in these different villages, um, especially in the absence of the formal um, land titling or zoning uh, that you might expect um, along a new road corridor. So I'm here, I, I wanna talk briefly about um, just a, a few final thoughts. Um, the first is just, uh, I think, to close in terms of saying that I think um, it's likely that legacies of earlier political conflict underlie various forms of uh, what I've called uh, socially uneven, um, the, the, the intersection of what I call um, in the book, uh, the intersection of property and citizen and effective citizenship. Um, and this is especially the case in landscapes that don't have um, a lot of uh, formal documents that, that are documenting property rights in a legal sense. I haven't really talked about the, the last third of the book here, which gets into the legal geography of um, land titling and zoning. Um, and um, the, the story that comes out of that is partially that the absence of strong legal property rights is what allows these earlier legacies to come through when it comes to um, the fights over property ownership. Um, this story turns out to be a little bit more complicated than that um, in the sense that these zoning maps actually help create some of the obfuscation for the poor numbers um, that, as I mentioned before, underlie continuing statistical measurements of the global land rush. Um, and so that legal geography is what allows me to then come back to these larger efforts to keep track of um, land deals, um, both within Laos and the, by, by extension and implications elsewhere um, across the global south. Um, and that there's a whole geography of ongoing property formalization um, that in some cases comes out of the development world um, of, of international development cooperation and land titling projects, um, 
But to some extent, it also comes out of local and internal government efforts to keep track of land itself and to fight over jurisdiction for um, internal territory. Often this has to do with the management of timber and the allocation of timber rents. Um, this is a story that I tell in the second part of the book um, in, a, in much more detail. I haven't had time to go into it here. Um, but in many ways, the timber economy is the tail that's wagging the dog of land use zoning that's getting in the way of keeping track of all of the statistics here. Um, lastly, the, I think um, one of the, the things that I think this case helps us think a little bit more about is the role of the state um, in an era where neoliberalism, especially in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, has um, increasingly developed a bad name. Um, and in the story that I've told, state intervention by and large um, has resulted in um, some pretty bad things in terms of the, the management of the resettlement process by the Lao government, um, as well as the role of zoning um, in terms of creating space for um, land grabs in these especially vulnerable communities. Um, one of the things that I didn't talk about in the talk though, is the way in which um, there was actually a pretty big subsidy program that underlay a lot of uh, the Chinese rubber projects that were coming into Northern Laos, um, uh, North, North, Northwestern um, uh, or Northeastern Myanmar as well, um, that sought to subsidize Chinese companies in ways that would help them work with communities um, in order to stem the, chide of the, stem the tide of opium um, into China's heroin market. Um, and this is actually a much, I think, more positive spin on post-neoliberal development and the potential role of the state in terms of helping development close the gap between corporate interests and the livelihood needs of the communities that they're working with. Um, and here, this, this gestures to some work that I've done in the book, but also some ongoing work that I've done with my colleague, Juliet Liu, in terms of looking at this um, opium replacement subsidy program, um, in terms of trying to tell not only the ways that it didn't work, but what could have been had these subsidy monies been regulated by the Chinese government a little bit more carefully in terms of stemming that gap um, and allowing companies to collaborate with Lao communities more along the, the lines initially uh, imagined by this um, three plus two contract farming scheme. And part of the reason that the three plus two scheme broke down was because the companies um, weren't really offering terms that were good enough for many of the farmers who wanted to participate in rubber to actually make it worth their while. Um, and so this is the, you can see there, there was a slippage from the low uptakes of the three plus two schemes into the more concession heavy and closure heavy deals like took place in, in Kentnam Fa. Um, but had there been a little bit more oversight over um, the, the subsidy program, there actually could have been a very different story going on here. Um, and so I think um, we're still very much in an era where um, the hand of the state is going to be present um, in, in some way or another. Um, and although the, this is in many ways a cautionary tale in terms of the way that that hand has, has pushed in the wrong direction, um, I, I think um, there's a lot of interesting counterfactual here that we could talk more about in terms of how it could have uh, been done better and hopefully in the future um, with a little bit more oversight from various corners um, could, be, uh, could move in a, in a more positive direction. So I wanna stop there um, and uh, let's, uh, let me turn it over to Michael for a little bit um, and then hopefully we'll get into some Q and A. Oh, um, thank you very much, Michael. It's a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, sure. I'm not gonna have all those sp specifics to give you very detailed questions to begin with, but maybe we can keep it very broad. Great. And it just seems part of this is of what's happening here obviously is the kind of thing James Scott is talking about with uh, states not liking mobile populations. And I wonder if this is, the part of the motive for Laos here is that do they is this a larger problem in Laos of, uh, uh, with, with these different groups? Um, the other another uh, thought I had was that uh, 
uh, you have also have tribal groups on the Chinese side of the border. And I'm wondering if Chinese business, businesses have operated the same way on the Chinese side of the border as they are with these land grabs in the Laotian portion. Uh, a, a third thing is, uh, is that, of course, what we when when those of us who don't deal with Laos hear about Laos, it's mostly about the damming of the Mekong and the ecological damage done, being done there. Yep. I'm not seeing this come out with the land grab so much because it's I, 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 rubber. I would imagine is not as ecologically damaging. But is this is this something that's happening on land, paralleling the ecological ecological damage being done to the riverway? Great questions. Um, okay, um, let me try to take these in turn. Um, yeah, Scott. Uh, James Scott's uh, both seeing like a state and also um, his more recent, um, what's the 2009 book, The Art of Not Being Governed, um, in many ways are unavoidable if you want to write about upland Southeast Asia and uh, Laos in particular. The governing of mobile populations is a tricky one. Um, one of the chapters that I didn't talk about here um, is about the 80s and 90s um, in Laos's timber landscape. And that has a sort of a simpler Scott type um, narrative in terms of um, upland communities are seen as mobile in the way, resisting state intervention and need to be moved out of the way in order to make space for timber and for state forest management. Um, in, in the story that I was telling here, there are bits of that, but they're actually, uh, and this is why I, I took such pains to, to make that map with the, with the dual sets of trajectories. Um, and one of the things that I, I spend a good bit of time talking about in the book is the way that upland populations um, are not only a hindrance for the state, but they're also really important resources for the state. Um, and in that sense, th there's, uh, it's pushing back a little bit on that, um, the, you could say the oversimplified version of state simplification that simply sees people as needing to be rooted in place. Um, and in the case that I talk about, this has to do with a few different things. One is if you have um, people who are nailed down too much in a sort of Scottian framework of high degrees of state legibility, it becomes very hard to create land availability for companies and hydropower projects and mines without giving large amounts of compensation. Um, and so Laos is uh, like a lot of governments in the global south here, on the, on the one hand, trying to keep track of its population, um, but, in, but also trying to do so in ways that doesn't um, nail it down too much in terms of making land acquisition too expensive. Um, and so one of the things that um, I've started thinking more about in terms, since I've, since I've finished the manuscript, because um, I don't talk a lot about the ways in which um, the government keeps track of populations through things like the household census books that are maintained at the village level and the household level and ID cards. Laos is very well inventoried. <laughs> um, I talk a little bit about this in an opening sketch at the beginning of chapter four with, with a map that shows up in the, um, in the, in the provincial museum. Um, but this inventorying is also mirrored, on the other hand, with um, a pretty loose set of representations when it comes to at least legal, uh, uh, legal land zoning and property. Um, so there, there's some of that um, trying to nail people down, but also the extent to which um, mobile, uh, so available land and also mobile labor um, is, a, is a huge resource for district government officials um, and to some degree provincial ones. One of the anecdotes that I didn't uh, talk about but that I talk about in the book um, has to do with district uh, officials recruiting villages um, that live in national protected areas to move to the borderlands of the province in order to essentially grab land from the neighboring provinces because the provincial boundaries are not very meaningful when it comes to um, the actual access of the timber <laughs> that sits uh, in those remote areas. Um, so there's there's a lot of population mobility that is also deployed by government officials um, in terms of trying to do their own business deals. Um, that sort of pushes back on that uh, on on the, the the Scott type approach. But there is very much um, uh, a Scottian dimension um, to 
to, to the sort of upland, mo upland mobility as a security threat. Um, second question, um, what's going on on the Chinese side of the border? Um, so in many ways, the, the rubber deals that have happened um, in Northern Laos and Northern Burma have sought to replicate the Chinese model um, by uh, bringing in Chinese companies um, and re, you could say, um, in having, having resettlement be part of that process. Um, one of the key differences though is that, is, is that in China, the rubber market is actually heavily protected. Um, and so a lot of the smallholders um, who have been involved in smallholding schemes in China have actually benefited pretty significantly um, because they have more reliable um, pricing of their rubber. This is the same way um, China manages it relatively similar to Thailand and Malaysia, which are also success stories when it comes to smallholder rubber development, often very heavily state managed. Um, but the difference is in Laos, um, they're essentially getting the state management when it comes to the plantation schemes, but not the price supports. Um, and so the, the Chinese side is actually, a, a, in many ways, it's a happier story when it comes to um, the involvement and the, re, the, the managing, um, especially of, uh, well, I should have backed up a little bit. In, in China, the, the, the plantations really started out as, um, uh, as state-owned plantations uh, that people were brought on to work um, through, the, through also um, upland consolidation and, the, and the, the forced stabilization of shipping cultivation. Um, but in the last say 15 or so years, those uh, a, lot of, a lot of the laborers um, who were initially brought onto the state plantations have then been allowed and encouraged to develop their own small holdings. Um, but still there's a, the, the protection of the, of the Chinese rubber market makes it pretty different on the Chinese side of the border. Um, and then the, the ecological damage question, this is, this is actually a really good question. And it's one that I don't have as satisfactory an answer to as I would like to. Um, you can certainly hear a lot of um, critiques of rubber in general and, and Chinese rubber in particular in the North um, for causing deforestation. Um, and yet the, the particular story that I saw was of active, this gets back to this active role of um, local government in terms of shaping where the plantations happen. In the, in the research that I was conducting and in the cases that I saw, the government officials um, were very deliberately and directly trying to keep the Chinese rubber plantations out of the national parks and to protect the good forest and to direct the plantations into the shifting cultivation fallows, which were seen as degraded forests of the people who were on um, the so-called beneficiary, uh, but I would say the receiving and, and often the, the, the victimization end of, of, these, of these plantation schemes um, because it was their farmland. Um, and so the, the ecological destruction story, you're right, is not the same as it is often for the Mekong story, be precisely because the plantations were directed into these uh, Swidden lands, which are already widely seen as as um, as degraded. Um, but there's this is this is part of a direction where I'm where I'm trying to go now by looking at um, some new research that's looking at forests and Red Plus and new plantation schemes. So I don't have as good an answer to that question as um, as I would like, and I think you're you're on the right track by asking it. Thank you. Now we have. Um... Uh, three comments, uh, questions. Uh, I'll just do all three of them and then you can sort it out because we have 15 minutes. I don't know how much time we have to do each one. So sure. the, from Gary Alex uh, commented that it was an interesting presentation. Thank you. This covers some of the issues that I've heard of and seen in Northern Laos and then began to make a few comments, but didn't, there was uh, some technical problem or something. So okay. we don't have those comments. Uh, okay. Patrick Slack uh, has said prior to displacement from the resettlement programs, and the secret war in Laos, what were historical livelihoods in Luang Namtha and Bokeo province? How had yep. French colonial interventions integrated or not these two needs through agriculture and or market-based interventions, for example, to the east in Pong Sali and, and uh, Zam Nua uh, yep. province? The French archives had detailed 
substantial property production by Hmong and Aka uplanders, which might have influenced openness crash crash crops, up uh, contract farming and or wage labor. How might these pre-war interventions influence further market and political power in the modern day? Do you want to take that one before we do the next? Yeah, one, let me or? take that. Yeah, okay. that's, a, that's, that's a great question. Um, so I talk a very little bit about this in the history chapter that I glossed over very quickly. But um, when I was talking about that Rand um, report from the early 70s, one of the things that I talk more about in that is, is this chapter two of the book is the ways that the U.S. took um, the different dimensions of French colonial administration in Laos and essentially tried to repurpose them toward their own territorial ends, especially in the uplands. Um, and so as Patrick points out, um, there was um, a pretty um, well researched, pretty what, what's now pretty well understood um, effort by the French to harvest opium from the uplands of Laos, um, same as they did in the uplands of Vietnam. Um, and the way that they did that was through a form of indirect rule that um, created upland hierarchies among the opium growing uh, groups that were seen to be culturally superior um, to the groups that didn't grow opium. Because this is pre-55, um, before opium was outlawed, it was, it was acknowledged as a vice, but it was really, it was developed as a state monopoly. Um, and because of some of the debates within France about whether French uh, should be a colonial power at all, um, French Indochina really had to make its own, uh, make its own money. Um, and so opium was essential um, to the budgets of not Laos um, in particular, but to French Indo Indochina as a whole. And so it really was um, uh, the, the use of, uh, as Patrick points out, upland groups like the Hmong uh, and the Aka um, uh, and, and the, the, the Mian um, were, uh, in particular, the, the, the Mian and the Hmong were often the, um, the, the local officials um, who were charged with collecting taxes um, from some of the other upland groups that were seen, uh, that were um, seen as less developed and in turn were given less power. Um, so the Lahu fall into that group, the Aka fall into that group. These were groups that sometimes grew opium, but sometimes would also work on the opium plantations of other communities. Um, so the simple answer is that there was um, a pretty heavy degree of indirect rule that um, turned a huge amount on the opium monopoly. Um, and the, you see traces of this both in the upland, uh, in, the, in the, the, set, the settlement and resettlement patterns of upland communities, but also in the ways that provincial officials talk about rubber. Um, I had a number of provincial officials tell me that rubber is kind of like opium um, in that they both involve skilled labor tapping of a resin. Um, and so it should be natural for upland uh, communities to, to figure out how to, to learn how to grow rubber because they've been growing opium for a long time. Um, so you see it in a couple of different ways. Um, there is also um, a narrative that you hear among government, government officials as well as among um, uh, a lot of development professionals that essentially rehearses this earlier colonial hierarchy of the Hmong as highly adaptable, highly um, uh, good, at, good at markets, good at cash crops, good at transitions, um, good at seizing new opportunities, and they're often contrasted with, uh, uh, with um, other, other upland groups, some of whom are seen to be um, longer, more indigenous residents, and some, but some of whom are also seen to be sort of the, the newer wave of arrivals like the Lahu. Um, I'm going to take in reverse order because the next question, the third question is shorter than the second. Uh, okay. The third question is the original village Nam Pha was La Hu Shi in the early 70s. Were those villagers moved into the Ket Nam Pha? The original, um, that's a great question. I, I don't actually know. Um, my, I, I talk about this in the book. Um, the extent to which I could reconstruct the resettlement trajectories um, really varied by time period and really by decade. Um, and so the best information that I have is the stuff that comes from the, the, the 90s. As I get back into the 80s and especially the 70s, I have no idea. Um, so one of the things that I'm, I, I think I'm pretty transparent about this in the book, 
but I can take the history um, up until about 1972. Um, and then I know that there was a lot of disappearance of things that were on the map before, but I don't know where they went. Um, so I, I would love to talk to William um, in more detail. Uh, if you drop me a note, I'll, I'd love to, to stay in touch, um, but I don't know. And I would love to know more. Okay, we have the, uh, the another lengthy question. The presentation, though perhaps not the book, suggests the Cold War Civil War uh, was responsible for the ethnic cultural split between Lao and tribal areas. That is certainly a factor, but there was quite a bit of split historically. The Mao areas were a source of slaves, maybe in a way this continues in forcing them to move to river plantations. The disruptions of the Civil War emphasized some distinctions, but greatly increased interactions. Some forced movements were likely directed at the losers in the war. Interestingly, I believe the La Hushi Gui uh, were not committed to either side in the war, but tried to evade it as much as possible. To the extent that they suffered in land decisions, uh, maybe more their poverty than past political affiliation. Not really a question. They're they're saying they are saying, yes. but I think that you know you can give a response comment on. Yeah, that. yeah, it's a really it's a really good comment. Um, one of the things that I talk about um, in the book, um, and that really um, that I had to figure out was precisely this point. Um, that the Lahu communities that are um, now really at the biggest losers of these land deals um, were, as yeah, as as the as the um, the comment points out, their position in the insurgency was not nearly as simple as was invoked by the um the government rationale and the government rhetoric that said that people were resettled into these areas because they were security threats my informants who were working in the development industry said that's not true that's garbage <laughs> these people are poor they've they're resettled because they're vulnerable they are not security threats um and I, I i make that clear in the book i think for both historical reasons and all as well as for ethical reasons i think it's really important to to, to point out um the ways the the difference between an actual security threat and one that's invoked because it it tells a nice economic story and helps helps rationalize a land grab. Um, but one of the things that did come through, and this echoes my uh, answer to to William's question, um, is that from the accounts of the insurgency that took place um, certainly in the late seventies through much of the eighties and even into the nineties, um, it was actually different ethnic groups. Um, uh, different subgroups of um, the of the indigenous people um, who had been there for hundreds of years um, that were sort of categorically referred to um, as the Lao Tung, um, but that made up were made up of a couple of different ethnic groups, but that were not Lahu, um, that were really the base and the heartland of the insurgency, um, and they actually were defeated earlier um, and resettled into a number of the other villages. Um, and in part, the, it had to do with the timing by which the Lahu groups were resettled much more than their association with actual insurgency that led to them being moved into this area that was then the target for enclosure. So I think um, both of these, these uh, uh, comments are, 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 are spot on um, in ways that I to some degree get to in the book, but that also, uh, especially in William's case, points to stuff that I didn't quite have access to. Well, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. We're getting towards the end. So uh, we have one more comment, and it's a, I think it's an appropriate one on which to close, I think, from William Great. Sage. Thank you, Michael, informative presentation. Well, I wanna thank you all for being here. Um, thanks again to Michael uh, for the introduction, um, and I'd love to stay in touch. And we, we're very happy with your talk. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. And then and to our attendees, thank you for uh, thank you for coming.